Okay, well, we welcome everyone here, those that are here in person, that those who are online. And we'll prepare ourselves this evening in our usual fashion by having a few moments of silent prayer, the option of naming privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins that ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our God, the God of righteousness and justice, mercy and freedom, and we're so thankful that you are in control of all things. We thank you for your word that is recorded and revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. You've done everything necessary for us to grow in grace and knowledge. So we pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate and have an open mind this evening. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to start by giving you a few PowerPoints about a man named David Horowitz. Anybody know who he was or is? Yeah. He started out as a communist. His parents were communists, and he was when he was 12 years old. And he eventually fell out with them and got... <laughs> I guess you could say he, he, he got into something worse. He became a Democrat. <laughs> uh, and, and then they went to the far left. And now he is a, a proponent of freedom. And he wrote a book recently called The Enemy Within. And I saw him on Fox Nation. Tucker Carlson was interviewing him. It was really an interesting conversation. He is very articulate, very well read. And But what caught my attention, I'll go ahead and put this on the board for you. David Horowitz has a new book entitled The Enemy Within. The dedication of this book is a bit unconventional, so I have ex excerpts of it, and I think you may find interesting. So I'll tell you a little tidbit. When Tucker Carlson was going through his dedication of the book, he also had it in print. And so I was reading as we went along, and it was over. I liked it so much, I thought, I've got to find that. I want to uh, show that to the church. And so I looked all over the Internet. I have to buy the book in order to get it. And then it dawned on me, dawned on me, I just went back. I still had it in my computer, and I just uh, print copied all those uh, texts, what was written about it, and I got it. So anyway, uh, it's unusual. Most of the time when a person does a dedication, it's dedicating in the home, on behalf of someone who helped them with a book or something like this. This one is different, and I'll show you. Dedicated to the millions of inner city kids forced into a democratic run failed public schools, which year in and year out deny them a shot at the American dream. The inner city inhabitants of America, America's violent crime zones by the Democratic Party and its criminally friendly officials, the innocent victims of criminal aliens in this country, thanks to the Democrats' sabotage of America's borders, the European and Asian Americans denied the right and opportunities by the systematic racism of woke institutions, the small business entrepreneurs and employees of all ethnicities whose life, work, and livelihoods have been destroyed during the virus by Democrats' dictatorial shutdown orders, and American patriots betrayed by Democrats' contempt for America's constitutional order and shameless support for its enemies, Islamic jihadists, and uh, China and Iran as well. Uh, you'll not find another 
uh, dedication in a book like that uh, is, is, is rare. I said he's articulate and he is unafraid. I have another one here. This is Mark Levin who uh, gave a critique or said had something to say about Horowitz's book. By the way, that's the, that's the cover of it here. You might not be able to see this. It says, how a dictatorial movement is destroying America. Aren't those lovely faces? <laughs> this is what Mark Levin said. Horowitz shows how the Democratic Party has embraced a worldview that is anti-constitutional, anti-American, racist, and totalitarian down to the pronouns we are permitted to use. This new Democratic Party is at war with the First Amendment, the independence of the judiciary, the separation of powers, and the two-party system. The enemy within is a book for all patriots who understand that our country is in a fight for its life. And this was by Mark Levin. So there you have it. I don't normally use um, quotes that reference a political party, but... Um, I did in this case because I think there wouldn't be anybody here that would want to argue that he is way off base. That uh, Horowitz is off base with what he said. I don't think anybody would argue that what he said is not true in his dedication is what I'm saying. Okay, if you'll open your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. I'll read Romans chapter 4, verse 1, and bring us up to speed. We're going to begin tonight. I don't have it on the board yet. Here it is. This is where we're going to begin tonight on verse 6. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has nothing to boast about, he has, excuse me, has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wage is reckoned as, is not, not reckoned as favor, which means grace, but as what is due. In other words, he, someone would be indebted to that one. Verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned or credited as righteousness. And here is where we're continuing tonight in verse 6. Just as David also speaks of the blessings upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. Now, the reason that Paul, as shrewd as he was, goes to... David, another Old Testament believer, is because David lived during the law. The Mosaic law had already been given to the Israelites. And so if someone wanted to make the case, well, the only reason that um, Abraham received the right righteousness of God was because he wasn't under the law. But people who are under the law have the law that is there for them to uh, get the righteousness from it. And so he is making another example of a person, this time David, who lived during the Mosaic law, and he's showing even when people lived under the law, they were still, would, God would still reckon 
their faith as righteousness and not works of the law. Okay? So let's look at Romans chapter 4, verse 6. Just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. It's amazing to me as we go through these scriptures how clear they are and how many times they negate works. Works is left out every time, completely and totally. And yet there are more people who believe that you have to have works in order to be saved, in order to receive your uh, approval of God than those who don't. Obviously, they either don't read the Bible or they have a pastor that is not uh, accurate or just doesn't teach what they need to hear. So one reason why Paul brought up David here is because someone would say Abraham couldn't keep it. We just went over all that. I'll just go down past this. Romans chapter 3, verse 28 is an answer to that. They say Abraham could have been righteous by keeping the law. Well, David lived and reigned under the law and said that God reckons righteousness apart from works of the law. So Paul is taking care of every, every exigency with regards to those who are trying to have works to be part of salvation, which they cannot do. Romans chapter 3, verse 28, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Galatians chapter 3, verse 11 through 12. Galatians 3, 11 through 12. Now that no one is justified by the law. Let's just stop there for a moment. What does that mean? It means that no one is justified by the law, isn't it? Isn't that what it means? Is it, is it hard to understand? No. In fact, it says it's evident that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. For the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. That means if you choose to be righteous before God by keeping the law, you have to live by that. Oh, I'm not glad that we don't have to. <laughs> We're not under that system where we have to be approved by God by keeping the law. Of course, nobody can keep the law. And if you're guilty in one area, one time, you are guilty of the entire thing because God is only happy with his righteousness. Anything that is short of that falls short of you having the right standing before God. If you're going to have the right standing before God, you have to be perfect in your righteousness, and we are in a positional way. And it only comes through what? Give me one word. Faith. Right. David also recognized that no one can work for blessings. Blessings come from God because of, first of all, his, his, of his grace. Blessings are a grace provision. They're not worked for. And two, because we have his own righteousness. So that's why we are blessed, because we have his own righteousness. Blessings, here's a, here's a definition here. God's favor and protection to confer prosperity or happiness upon. That's what blessings are. God's favor. That word favor in our verse is charis, which means grace. So God's blessings come from his grace. And he doesn't owe us anything. And we can't impress him with our works. So, in our verse up here, let's go to it. Just as David also speaks of the blessings upon man. 
That's what we have down here now. The blessings upon man. The word blessings there in the Greek is makariasmos. Makariasmos, I should say. M-A-K-A-R-I-S-M-O-S. -S. This is a noun accusative, singular, masculine. Accusative means it's the direct object. It's a pronouncement of being in receipt of special favor with God, especially one that results in an happy estate or blessings. So when you see the word blessing, a lot of times it is translated happy. It shows that you are or that you have special favor from God, one that results in a happy state of blessings. This same word was used in Romans chapter 4, verse 9. Verse 9 says, well, we're not to verse 9 yet. We'll get to that. If we had to work to be blessed, then it wouldn't be blessing. It would be payment for our work and there would be no grace in it. How many people do you think are working to be blessed? I mean, they're out there hustling. They don't understand that blessing is grace. We can't earn it or deserve it. And God interacts with us according to his grace, and there is no grace. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who have really pushed in order to impress God with the works that they have done. And they must get exasperated from time to thing, time, uh, thinking, well, surely this would buy me something, some kind of blessing, and yet that won't happen. I say, see the Grace Pipeline on the CBC. I, co I told you that last time, and guess what? I now have it. So I won't have to describe it. You can see it. And here it is. Let's see from current site. By the way, I just got this right off our website. It's a little bit small. I'll read it to you, though. Up here, this, some of it is missing. It says, Grace Pipeline. The first box here says, God blesses sinful man without compromising his perfect justice and righteousness. And in order to do that, we have to understand this box. We are not blessed because of what we do for God, but because of what God does for us. If he blessed us based on the things that we do, the things that we do are so far below his perfect standard that he can't count them or else he would have to be compromising his own justice and righteousness. So we start up here with God's justice and we go down here to God's righteousness. What the justice of God requires, the righteousness of God provides. It seems like that ought to be upside down. I don't know if I have that right or not. It seems like what the righteousness of God demands, the justice of God carries out. I don't know when I did this. <laughs> what? Yeah, imputed righteousness to every believer. Um, I, I still think that it's the, what the righteousness of God demands. What his, see, his righteousness says, what is required of you to be in good standing with me? is to have my own righteousness. And so what God's righteousness demands, the justice has to carry out. And he carries it out in blessing. Sorry, I didn't see this before. Uh, I just took it off our website, but I have to look at that. It does say imputed to every believer, but I contend that God's righteousness is where it starts. That is what requires us to be perfect like he is and it's the justice of God that carries out so when we have faith in Jesus Christ then we are justified 
the justice of God has been carried out because now we have God's own righteousness on the uh, fact that we have had faith in Jesus Christ. It just seems like in my mind, does anybody... What? Go ahead. Lay out. I guess you're right. That the order has already been given. If you start with the, the, the with the premise, we don't see it. It's up here. <laughs> the righteousness of God has already required that the justice of God kick into gear, and this is blessings, logistical grace blessings here, and it comes down where God's righteousness is imputed to the believer. It took about three of us to help figure that out. How many of you can remember hearing, and some of you are from Baraka Church, and you've heard a thousand times what the righteousness of God requires, the justice of God carries out. But the righteousness of God up here has already pronounced, and this is the justice of God carrying it out, and it winds up being imputed to every believer. And this pipe is blessings, this logistical grace, but all these blessings coming down. And all these other things, these are a personality, talent, tithing, social action, sacrifice. We have tithing twice. I don't know why. Self-righteousness. Emotionalism, sincerity, service, giving, prayer, witnessing, morality, anything that we try to do in order to be blessed as hard as we work cannot penetrate that grace pipeline. And the reason is because God blesses us on the basis of what he does for us, not what we do for him. And if he did bless us on what we do for him to impress him, then he would be compromising his perfect essence. Is that clear to everybody? Yes. Well, I, yeah, I've, I've, see, I don't remember, this is a long time since I've seen this, but I think I have other, I could find another grace pipeline that starts out with the righteousness of God up here. Chris made a good statement. This is picking up after the righteousness of God has already made the demand and the justice kicks in and imputes God's righteousness to every believer. And we have down here at the bottom some verses, Matthew 6, 33, Romans 3, 21 through 22, which we were just there not long ago, and Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, all has to do with this. This is a basic, fundamental doctrine that you understand when you receive blessings from God, you can't crow about it. You can't uh, strut about as if you've done something. It's all received by grace. And you might be surprised how many people don't understand that. There are probably people you know that are out there hustling and working in order to be blessed from God. All blessings from God is based on who and what He is and his grace provisions for us. Okay. Well, in some ways I'm glad I had that. In some ways I'm not. I just noticed that while I was teaching it. Okay. Let's get back to Romans now. Romans 4, 7. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. This is more of this verse than meets the eye. Is the verse referring to believers? And if so, how do you know? David isn't in there. I know, but we're not on the one before. How, I'm, 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 first of all, let's get the first question answered. Is this verse referencing believers? Yes. 
How do you know? There you go. Yeah, very good. Yeah, because it says those who have been forgiven. And that's the key. It's talking about believers here, and they are blessed. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds, normally that would be um, a different word in, in the Greek. Hamartia is for sins, but it says lawless deeds because it's anomia. The a is an a, it's a negative a, and the nomia comes from namos. So then, if you have, which means the law. So if you have an a before the law, it means unlawful. So it says lawless deeds. Have been forgiven, and those sins have been covered. This is a quote from Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2. This psalm was written by David after his adultery with Bathsheba and his murder of her husband. This is found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Her husband was Uriah, Uriah, uh, the, uh, Uriah the Hittite. And he had him murdered. And so we want to look at this for a moment. Put a marker in Romans where we are and turn to Psalm 32. Psalm 32, and we're going to read verse 1 through 5. Now, when you get to Psalm 32, you might make a, a little notation in the margin is there is a comparable verse or psalm that is similar to this, and it's Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a psalm of David, which was written after he had done his nefarious things with Bathsheba and had Uriah murdered. It's the same subject matter in Psalm 51 as it is here in Psalm 32. And we're going to read only the first five verses. Verse 1 and 2 is where we get Romans chapter 4. And verse, what we own six, seven. A psalm of David, a maskil. Maskil means it's a poem to teach or instruct. How blessed, or you could say how happy, happy is those whose transgressions, transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now he goes, he's explaining what it was like before he had acknowledged his sin. Verse 3. This is regarding pre-rebound suffering. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning, means screaming all day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away with the fervent heat of summer he had loss of energy. Verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to thee, that would be God the Father, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, he said to himself, 
I will confess, I will acknowledge my transgressions to the Lord, and thou didst forgive the guilt of my sin. Okay? So when we go back to, let's go back to Romans chapter 4 and verse 7. You have, you have kind of a better feel for what is the context of this verse. You have to know that after David had done these horrible, wicked deeds that he felt guilty. And when he even expresses in that psalm that the lawless deeds, blessed is a man or happy is a man whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sin has been covered. I think I may have given you this last time, I'm not sure. There's another word that can be used for blessed or blessed. That's eulogetos, E-U-L-O-G-E-T-O-S. The E-U means good, and the logos means word. It means to speak well of someone or to praise someone. And... This word is only used and addressed to God, acknowledging his goodness. It is applied only to God. So you have in the Bible a unique word that sometimes is translated blessed. You'll see several times in the Old Testament, bless the Lord. Well, we can't bless the Lord. What do we have to bless? We can't bless the Lord, but this word is what the one that's used. It's talking about to praise, to speak well of. It's found in Mark 14, 61, Luke 1, 68, Romans 1, 25, Romans 9, 5, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, 2 Corinthians 11, 31, Ephesians 1, 3, and 1 Peter 1, 3. I remember years ago when I was a boy, I used to hear the preacher say, we need to bless the Lord. And I always thought, how can I, what do I have to bless the Lord with? He owns everything anyway. What can I give him he don't even already have? And it makes sense now that it means to speak well or to praise the Lord. So that's what I do. And I'm reading the Bible and it says, bless the Lord all my soul and all that is within me. Bless the Lord. I read that as praise the Lord. I think that is the meaning. The reason that God imputed his own righteousness to David rather than his lawless deeds is because he believed in the promise of the Messiah, the Savior, who would take away the sins of the world. What a tremendous blessing it is to receive the righteousness of God rather than a one-way ticket to the lake of fire. Boy, should we have gratitude for that. Because we had faith because we believe that what God said in his word, that Jesus Christ took upon himself our iniquity, our sin. He paid for it in his own body. And if we believe that, then we have God's imputed righteousness. You can't work for it. I hope you understand how important what I just said is that need to be imparted to the masses. Because I would say probably way up in the percentages, maybe up in the 90 percentile, people don't understand that. And they still think that they have to do good and they have to be uh, doing good works and so forth in order to be saved. Now, when a person is saved, even in the Old Testament, automatically they receive the righteousness of God. They have to. Because we cannot stand before God on anything that we have to offer. The only thing that he accepts is believing in his son, Jesus Christ. So he believed in the promise of Messiah, the Savior. At that point, David didn't know it was going to be Jesus Christ. He didn't know his name, but he knew the promises. No doubt he knew about Genesis 3.15, 
where the seed of the woman would be, which would be Jesus Christ, would put his the ultimate demise on the serpent, which was referring to Satan. He knew all these things. The disparity between legalism and grace is seen most clearly in the way God grants a right standing to people of faith. And then I just wrote there in brackets, rather than of works. People who are trying to be acceptable to God, not only are they arrogant, but they're very legalistic. They might not have a book of works that they keep a tally on, but they keep it in their head. What a shame. Working. Well, the Bible says when you're working in order to receive the righteousness of God in order to be acceptable to God, you're getting further and further away from where you need to be. You'll never get it that way. And the harder you work, the further you're getting away from grace. What so many of them lack is humility. And that's why some God, uh, excuse me, sometimes God will body slam a person in order to get their attention. Because they have to be humble. They have to know that they cannot have a right standing before God on their own. And all they have to do is believe. So let's see, we have here, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. We're going to look at been forgiven here. Have been forgiven. The Greek word there is aphiemi, A-P-H-I-E-M-I. It's aorist passive indicative, and it means to release from legal or moral obligation or consequence, to cancel, to pardon. When Old Testament believers believed the gospel, their sins were forgiven. And when they acknowledged their sins to God, their sins were also forgiven. We saw that in Psalm 32, verse 5, just a moment ago, didn't we? Old Testament believer, that happened. Now, if you look at this verse close, study it close, you might have a question. It might th you might think, now wait a minute. When Old Testament believers believed the gospel, their sins were forgiven. If their sins were forgiven, why did they have to acknowledge their sins after they were saved and their sins were already forgiven? Well, here's the thing. A lot of people, even believers that are growing in grace, have a little misconception about the forgiveness that takes place when you believe in Jesus Christ. When a person believes in Jesus Christ, every sin that he has ever committed is forgiven. It's removed as far as the east is from the west. But it doesn't mean that all his future sins are forgiven. Now you have to keep something in mind not to get confused. When Jesus Christ paid for the sins of the world on the cross, the debt, the penalty for death, completely, past, present, and future, was wiped away. That is a judicial issue. Forgiveness is a relationship issue. You never have, have you ever been in a court word, a courtroom and they talk about forgiveness? No, you're either guilty or you're innocent. Forgiveness doesn't enter into it because it's it's a judicial case, it's not about a relationship. So when you believe the gospel, all your sins are forgiven up to that point. But from that point on, post salvation you're going to rack up more sins, aren't you? And the only way those sins are forgiven is that what we saw for the Old Testament believers, like David, was by acknowledging those sins and God forgave him. 
It's the same way in the church age. Because I've heard so many times pastors and other people say that when Jesus Christ was on the cross, he paid for all your sins and all your sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. And that's not true. All your sins up to the point of salvation were forgiven. But if, if they were all forgiven, even the future sins, why does the Bible command us to acknowledge our sins to God for them to be forgiven? So you have to keep this judicial issue. Jesus Christ was condemned for all our sins. We cannot be condemned for them, no matter how many sins that we commit, because in a judicial issue, Christ received them all. But that's not the issue with regarding to forgiveness. Y'all understand that? It's a relational ship issue. I've, had, I've said this to other people, and I said, well, what happens if you are a believer and you died and you hadn't rebounded in six days? You hadn't acknowledged your sins to God in six days. What happens then? Would those sins be forgiven? Well, they just don't matter. I mean, it means you might be out of fellowship when you die. Does that have any consequence at all with what's going to happen when you die? No. There are religions built on the idea that you have to hurry up and make have a priest say something over you before you die because you're not to die in a um, venial sin or what's the other kind of sin, the uh, mortal sin. Does that clarify it for you? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> she said, well, we might go to park pur purgatory. <laughs> Oh, I know they do. You, do. you Excuse me there. Okay, that's important for people to understand. We're talking about have been forgiven. That's why I wanted to make that point clear. All our sins up to that point are forgiven from then on. We have to acknowledge it to God. And the sins that were taken care of at the point of salvation and the sins that we acknowledge after salvation still does not keep us from being saved. They have nothing to do with it, as we will see as we continue. The point is forgiveness of sin is a take away or a subtraction. The imputation of divine righteousness is an addition. It is the addition of the imputation of divine righteousness that per permits saved humans to live with a perfect God. And we do not earn or deserve it. It is a gift from God. How can we earn this association with a perfect God by our works? You can't. Now we have the phrase up here. Let me get to it. <clears throat> whose sins have been covered. Blessed or happy are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. And you understand what that means now, right? Now we have, and whose sins have been covered. Ooh, has been covered. And whose sins have been covered. The word have been covered is one word in the Greek, and it's epikalypto. E-P-I-K-A-L-U-P-T-O. It's a verb. It's an heiress passive indicative. And it's a stratagem for concealing something, cover or veil. So does God cover up our sins? This refers to the sins of Old Testament believers whose sins were covered but not yet taken away. Remember that? They would be taken away when Jesus Christ finished 
His atoning work on the cross which propitiated the justice of God. We went over this not too long ago. The only thing that God could do with the Old Testament believers is to have sacrifices, sacrifice animals and so forth to give them a preview of what was going to take away the sins of the world, which was the Lamb of God who voluntarily went to the cross for us. So that's, see, I'm always amazed at how precise the, the Bible is. Whose sins are covered. No one in the New Testament would say that. Because Jesus Christ has already come. David was sharp. Well, Paul was sharp. He's quoting David. And he uses the right word, which is covered. Now, in Romans chapter 4, verse 8, I worked on this a while, and one thing lit up my mind that I saw in a different translation. In the, in the New American Standard Version, which I use, I put it here because I'm comparing it with the New King James. That should be new, by the way. I left the new, the N off here. The New King James Version. And in the New American Standard Version, it says, Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. And that's the phrase that got me. I thought, what is it talking about? Then... I looked in the New King James Version, and it says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Impute sin. Well, gizomai is the same word for impute and to uh, take, uh, will not take into account. But it, it, it opened up my mind because has there ever been anyone who God imputed sin to someone. All our sins are imputed to Christ. That's why sin is no more an issue, because Christ took care of it. And since Christ was imputed, had our sins imputed to him, That means that then God could impute to us his righteousness because we are no longer guilty before God because Christ took care of it. God imputes his righteousness to sinners. He doesn't impute sin to sinners. He imputes sin to Jesus Christ. That's the only way it could be for God to take care of our sin problem. So we have here, shall not impute sin. The word is logizomai, L-O-G-I-Z-O-M-A-I. We had this earlier on. Verb, heirs, middle, subjunctive. It means to charge to one's account, to reckon. Now Psalm 32 is a companion psalm. That thing jumps up there. I didn't do it. Okay, it's gone. (laughs) <laughs> psalm 32 is a companion psalm to psalm 51 in both psalms he was is overwhelmed by the grace of god forgiving of his sin now just think if you were king and everybody looked up to you and you saw a beautiful woman naked taking a bath on top of her house that's where that occurred taking baths there you ordered her into your chamber and you had your way with her, and then you found out that her husband was a soldier, a a very good soldier in his army, and of course she got pregnant, and he ordered Uriah to come back home to be with his wife. So it made it look like the child would be his child, not David's. But Uriah was so righteous, he said, far be it from me to go in and have pleasure with my wife with all my cohorts are out there in battle. I won't do it. David was frustrated. So he just said, okay, what we'll do. He ordered um, that, huh? 
No, not Uriah. Uh, I was thinking about what's, what was David's number one in command. I know who he is. Uh, Joab, yeah. He ordered Joab to arrange an attack on the enemy that would be foolish and put Uriah right in the front to make sure that he was killed. So he has done these dastardly things and he's amazed that God would not impute sin to him, but would impute righteousness because God trusted in the Lord and his salvation. In spite of the enormity of David's sin and the utter absence of personal merit, God still would not impute sin to him. Why? Did God show partiality to David? We know, no. Did God look the other way? No. When a believer acknowledges sin, his sin to God, it is impossible for him to still impute sin to him or refuse to forgive him. Very powerful statement. When you acknowledge your sin to God, it's impossible for him to still impute sin to you, to credit you with sin. Why? Because you're forgiven by acknowledging that sin. Psalm 103, verse 11 and 12. For as the heavens are as high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him, those who are humble towards him, those who acknowledge their sins to him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. What is being described here is the opposite of imputing sin. That's what we deserve, isn't it? But God doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us grace. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. I was reading in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy has to do with the second. It's the second giving of the law and all these things. And Moses was telling the people about when he, when they went into to take the land and so forth. And he's speaking for God. He's, in fact, he's speaking in the first person as if it's God speaking. And God is telling him, look, when you go into the land, and you are able to subdue them and take the land. Don't think it's because of anything you've done that is righteous. You are a stiff-necked and rebels. I am going to give you victory because I have already promised that I would do so. And it's going to bring glory to me, but don't strut about and think it's anything that you did. And then he tells them again, you are a rebellious, stiff-necked people. On at least two occasions, they made God so angry that he told Moses, I'm going to destroy them, and I'll start over with you. That happened twice. And yet, look at the grace they received. When they went into battle, God was before them. He says, you're going to go against cities that are better than you people that are better than you with regards to military, they have walls all the way up to heaven. And they are mightier than you. But you will conquer them because I will go before you. And I think this that has something to say here. We can't take any credit when God forgives our sins. It's because of grace. It's because of what Christ did on the, on the cross. So the reason that God blots out our transgressions, look, he says, for my own sake. Do you see that? It's not because we're any more special than anybody else. We're all in the same boat, despicable sinners. Now, I don't, I don't think I'm going to start here. This is... This verse can be considered, could be seen in a larger sense as well. 
But I don't even think I'm going to go into it. I've got less than five minutes. And if I get into it, it I'll, it's just not a good time. Yes. It seems that God punished David for his sin. I'm getting to that, yeah. Oh. That, that, okay. See, that's but about him... two more paragraphs down. Oh, okay. But I'm glad you said that because if somebody might just hear this message and not hear it far, any further and think, well, boy, we can... Let the good times roll. He did let him David choose. was severely punished. I mean, it, David had so much punishment that God had to give it to him in increments. It doesn't mean that we don't um, that we don't get disciplined. We do get disciplined. But when David was being disciplined, he was humble. He acknowledged those sins to God and it didn't have anything to do with his salvation. His relationship with God was maintained and when he acknowledged his sin to God, then they became bearable. So there is, it's not to say that you will never be disciplined or punished for your sins. That's not the case at all because you are. But there's a reason when, when you acknowledge your sin, your, your sins are forgiven as far as the east is from the west. But you still might have to face the consequences of those sins. But when you do, you're doing it in our age under the filling of the Holy Spirit. We are right with God. The suffering we have is bearable. And we continue, can, can continue to grow in grace and knowledge as we go on towards spiritual maturity. So th I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit that in about another paragraph or so. And I, I could have put it here, but I had something else going on here. Any other questions? Aren't you glad that God does not impute sin to sinners? <laughs> yes, I'm a gene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh yeah well the, you know it's, I look at it this way uh, first of all this church is based upon what the Bible says and the Bible says it's faith alone nothing else but I believe when you humble yourself in order to either believe the gospel or in order to acknowledge your sins to God, that's in a, for, in a fashion of repentance. A change of mind. It's metanoeo. That's what, re, that's what the word repentance means. And when you change your mind from keeping your sin away from acknowledging it to God, when you change your mind and you humble yourself and acknowledge that means you've changed your mind about hiding it from God. Now you're humble. And that's all that God wants. For us to be right with him, we have to be humble. And I think that in, incorporates that metanoeo. You change your mind. When David was up in the middle of the night screaming and his body felt, felt like his bones were coming, across, uh, coming apart, he hadn't acknowledged his sins to God. But he metanoeoed in a sense of changed his mind about that. He humbled himself, acknowledged to God what he had done, and there was punishment still to come, but it was bearable. And <laughs> Boy, is it ever... I'm Jean said, it's hard to witness the people who already have their mind made up. It's like concrete. <laughs> yeah. It's like concrete, all mixed up and hardened. So we have to just do our best. Any more? Okay, let's close. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this time we can come together and look at these verses from a standpoint that just shines more light on your glory and your plan and your phenomenal grace. We pray that we will meditate on these things, incorporate them into our own soul, that we will be eager to be able to explain them to other people 
but we have to use discernment and wisdom and be careful who we do that to because they have to be hungry. They have to want to hear this. And we give it to them and the Holy Spirit is involved. Whew, what glory there is there and it's all for you. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.